Welcome to the Belfry Hockey Podcast. My name is Daryl Belfry, and we are in Season 3, and this is Episode 11. I'm going to do a Part 2 of last week's session, which was on one-on-one development and private lessons. And I want to have a little bit more of a technical discussion. A lot of things I've learned over the years to make those sessions a lot more efficient, a lot more effective, uh, and get more out of it for the athlete. And many of these things took me quite a while to get to. Um, but over the years, I have learned a few things to become a lot, a lot more effective in that setting. One of the first things that I learned was I was gassing my players out too quickly. And so if it was an hour long session, I would have them gassed out with the last 20 minutes to spare. And they just, I would get to a point where it was almost like unusable ice, which is certainly not efficient. And, uh, and, and what I've learned is, is that it, depending on the topic uh, of what it is that you're working on. So for example, like skating, if it's a heavy skating, like power skating type session, One of the things that I found was I was so aggressive with the skating development that I was gassing them out. One of the things that I ran into was my when I was trying to be intense or, you know, there was an area where we were really trying to drill down on. I found that the duration of the rep was too long. The distance was too far. And the number of reps I was trying to get in there was too many. And then the player was then gassed out. So, you know, I did a lot of stuff like length of the ice. I would go from one end all the way to the other end. And I had all these different patterns and stuff. And by the time we got 30, 40 minutes in, player was completely done. What I learned to do was manage the time so and manage the duration. So if it was something that we were really focused on and had a high level of intensity then I would really shorten the duration and the, and try to really get good reps in and make sure that the player was rested, etc. One of the things I also did was I would get carried away with reps, especially if I really liked the direction we were going. I would go, okay, let's do it again. Let's do it again. Let's do it again. Next thing you know, the player's done it six, seven, eight times. And, you know, that those really compile to the energy level of the athlete. So, what I found that I, what really worked for me was doing three reps and then stopping and having whatever a discussion, an adjustment, uh, maybe review video and then get back at it. So the player had a chance to kind of recover. And I just didn't understand all of that early on. And, you know, I thought, well, this athlete's out of shape or this is a reflection of their skating inefficiency, that this is why they're gassing out. And yes, those things could be true. The real problem, though, was I, was I wasn't making enough adjustments. So even if the athlete doesn't have the fitness and they also don't have good skating inefficiency, they have skating, skating inefficiencies, that doesn't really discount my responsibility for adjusting to the athlete to make sure that they could survive the session and get the most out of it. So that was a, a major part that I really struggled with early on and I could tell like the player was falling off and then when I would watch my video back I could just see like the technique was a fatigue issue so I was grading or as I'm watching the reps on the technique of what I wanted to change and the player was wasn't capable of really getting into those positions anymore because I had fatigued them and so now I'm barking at stuff that we're just not going to be able to influence. The player doesn't have a fair chance to be able to make the, that that play. So that that was really important. That was number one uh, thing that I, that I learned. The other thing that I learned was the value in trying to make because a one-on-one session you're really trying to influence movement. You know, you, you're also trying to influence the way they think, but it's really t- highly technical movement. It's skating development, it's shooting development, it's the way in which they're, it's like movement with a puck, how they manage their skating, separating the upper body from the lower body, pass catching, it's a highly technical and you're trying to influence their technique. So in situations where I'm trying to influence their technique. I want to get to, you know, really get good reps and have a great sequence 
of development as we're as we're moving along. So, really coming up with a, a good ability to to watch the players' reps to make the the adjustments that we needed to that we need to make, and through that process, in the technique, really understanding how feel it works as it relates to making physiological pattern changes. So when players try to learn a new movement pattern, they have to they have to go through uh, a process to revamp what the feel of that movement should be. And one of the things early on that I started to understand is I couldn't understand when a player was moving clearly inefficiently. And they, you know, the joints were not moving in the proper order. There's just no way that that could feel good. However, it did feel good because that's what the player was used to. So the fact that they were used to it made it feel okay for them. Like they didn't know any different. And then when and then I would come along and I would start to try to influence that and make, make the development more pointed and get the, the joints to move in the proper order... The player felt awkward, and I'm like, "How the hell is that supposed? How does that feel awkward? It should feel better." Not realizing that I'm battling habit, and the fact that it feels good is because it feels familiar, because that's their normal way of doing things. So, what I had to overcome was, and this is where failure, the the use of failure, and what we talked about last week is so critical, because in that situation. The failure aspect of it is not actually a failure of movement. It's uh, trying to reshape what good feels like in the player. So trying to get them to feel uncomfortable, the more they feel uncomfortable, the better it is because that means that they are executing an unfamiliar movement pattern. So the more it's uncomfortable, the better we like it. So I would ask the player, how does it feel? And the player would say, yeah, it feels weird. Good. Yeah, it feels awkward. Good. Yeah, it, I don't, I, you know, it feels very different. Those adjectives to describe how they felt was confirmation for me that we were moving in the right direction. We were making good progress because now we're at least have a chance to reshape. And the objective then is to, if you looked at it like from like a like an arc, you say, okay, it feels what they do normally is inefficient as it relates to proper movement mechanics, but it feels good to them because it feels familiar. Okay, so let's start now breaking that movement pattern down and get it to feel awkward. The more awkward it is, the more likely it is that we are you know, reshaping the movement. So and, you know, you get into these, like, one one good, one bad, two good, two bad. You know, it's like, it's very inconsistent, of course, because they're still trying to feel, feel through it. And attaching the movement to feel is so critical at that point. Even if they're not necessarily that way inclined, it's then your responsibility to make sure that they're that way inclined. They got to learn... The first thing is to teach them how to feel and be receptive to the way their body is feeling in movement. That's why sometimes slowing it down is effective because they can kind of feel the way each movement is supposed to feel or where their body is supposed to be at different times. Plus, there's, there's a lot of compensations that are occurring in movement because player just isn't strong enough to hold certain positions at different times. So by slowing it down, you're holding them in a posture that they're not normally strong enough to. So you're actually kind of strengthening some of those some of those pieces without even like without really strengthening it. You're at least creating a familiarity of being kind of held in that posture. And you're stressing the body to hold that to hold that posture throughout the movement, and you're doing it at a slower pace, so they have to hold it for longer. You're making some good progress there, plus creating that sense of feeling awkward for a longer period of time. It's very good. So, as you're through the arc, you're starting to make it feel awkward, 
and then it, and it's inconsistent because their body will naturally try to go to where it's familiar and so they're gonna they're gonna revert back and so you're trying to battle through that and then ultimately you're gonna get to a spot where you're starting to get consistent with the new movement and it still kind of feels a little awkward but you're consistent this is a critical time in the development of move, movement chain because when when the player is consistent and it feels awkward what you're trying to do is is build a new feeling of, of familiarity so the more I work on it I and this is why reps are so important at certain times in player development because if you're trying to reshape a movement pattern this can be a critical part of their development particularly when you're working on skating for example that's a, an obvious one because any impact I can make in their skating is going to have a major impact in virtually everything else that we do so if I because in order for me to improve their skating it starts with posture balance and edge control you, you can't really improve skating without touching those three things it doesn't matter what you're doing you're hitting all of those so i'm putting them in a better posture they have now better balance and i can get them on an edge and control the edge in a way that makes sense for the movement then i need to be able to get the joints to work in the proper order so i can't have a lot of players leave their hips behind or they leave their leave their ankles behind and 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 those two parts never never get involved um and so they're very knee dominant right and so they lack a lot of times a lot of posture because they hinge those hinge meaning they they their their posture from their back is now over top of their skates like they're folded over top so their knee their shoulders are past their knees at, the, at times and this this posture problem is going to affect everything it affects their vision on the ice it affects the way they can move it affects literally all their puck handling everything gets affected so if I could improve that posture by getting their back angle and their shin angle to be parallel that's the optimum posture if that I want them in so I'm always evaluating first posture and balance and then edge control to try to get these pieces to kind of fit together and then now as the movement goes there's going to be certain times where they're in that posture like if you can think of a turn one of the problems with players when they turn and they're trying to rebuild turning many of them when they turn to their weak side so many of them are strong side turners so they'll often turn one way really well and another way absolutely terrible and one of the re one of the problems with that is when they're turning to the way in which they do not like to turn which is often to their forehand side when they're doing that they don't grab that outside edge of the of that inside foot very well they have very poor pod there's not a lot of weight on that foot the weight is still turning on the outside so if they're let's say they're right-handed shot when they turn to their right, going to their backhand side, uh, sorry, to their forehand side, but it's on, going towards their backhand, so they're on that backhand side going uh, towards the right, their outside edge is usually much more effective, and, and the weight that they're willing to put on that foot is much better. When they go to the left, and now they're going towards their forehand side, they're still turning with the right foot on the inside edge. That's where the majority of the weight is. They don't transfer the weight onto the outside edge of the, of the, uh, of the inside foot. So they're turning basically with one foot in both directions, the same foot. They're just their right foot turners. So that whole feeling of now putting them on the outside edge on the inside foot is is a real challenge because it feels terrible because there's so much time that they've spent on that right foot so they have to release that 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 timing uh, uh, to get and or weight over to the left foot 
and get on that outside edge, which they're unfamiliar and uncomfortable with. And that's a major part of the learning process. In doing that, when it gets awkward, one of the first compensations that they do is they change their posture. So they'll, when they're going towards that left, many of them will fall back on their heels. So they take their back and they straighten their back or they even like overextend it going backwards. So now the turn gets shortened because now they're basically going to come to a stop. They have no shin angle because now the knee has, has fallen back with the back angle. So now they're bit essentially on their heels. And so the turn just gets, it has no chance to be successful. So the first adjustment as they're trying to learn to transfer their weight over to that left foot is to nail the posture so they can keep their back angle and their shin angle parallel. And then that allows them to stack the weight of their upper body onto that edge. That's that there's a lot of feel that's going there. And you can see like these, these common problems are going to come up no matter what. Same with stopping. A lot of times you have problems with players who want to stop. They really struggle stopping uh, both directions effectively. And they tend to struggle with weight transfer going, particularly when the weight transfer has to go to the outside edge. They really don't like that. Outside edge is underdeveloped at most age groups. And this is like one of the key things that you're trying to do. So that's a, a major aspect of it is honing in on the po po the posture to affect the balance to get the, the 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 weight stacked in the proper spot to then put the pressure on that edge so then you can build the edge development up so that's a whole sequence that you're doing with younger players to try to affect their ability on that outside edge and the feel is going to feel awkward because they don't want to leave that that right foot they, to get to the left foot so that's your constant battle to try to get them there and uh and so that's why the reps are so important because now you can start making these these inroads and one of the things i also noticed when when i was doing corrections is that many times it's easier to to affect the back angle first so i like to set and it's this is there's a lot of people that I've run into, a lot of really good skating coaches that like to work from the feet up. And then there's me, I really like to work from the head down. And it's just my own personal preference. I don't think it's right or wrong. It just A lot of times it depends on the athlete. There's times I do work from the feet up. It just depends on the athlete and where they're at. But I don't do it the same way like all the time. Like there's certain situations that would cause me to do it to create a different approach. So again, and sometimes, sometimes I shouldn't, don't say sometimes. Most of the time, the decision making for me comes down to the feel of the athlete, of what we're trying to impact, impact, because I'm trying to create that uncomfortable feeling to affect change. Now, as the arc starts to move forward with this and they start to get in a better position technically to be able to execute the movement, essentially, if I'm able to get the, the posture right, balance right, they're on the right part of their blade and they're using the joints in the proper order, that is going to feel better because that's the way the body is intended to move. So once I get that, the player is going to start to feel better. And that was, and then you start to hear them start to say, I say, how did that feel? Well, that felt better. Okay, well, how did that feel? That one felt a lot better. And then you're gradually moving it because you now have the consistency. And this is one of the things I struggle with is like, first, I have to get them into failure. And failure is actually a great path in this case because failure is pulling them out of a movement pattern that is inefficient. And, and, and that's the, actually the failure. For them, it's success because it feels good because it's familiar. So first step, failure. Now, when you're working there, there's going to be a period of time 
in which you're going to have a tremendous amount of inconsistency because you're fighting the body's natural move, natural tendency to go to what's comfortable, even if it's in, uh, even if it's inefficient. So you got to work through that, and eventually you're going to get to a space where you can consistently put them in the right position with the right balance, with the right edge control, with the right posture, but it still doesn't feel good. And this is where the reps count. This is where you got to keep repping it out because eventually it's going to feel better, feel better, feel better. And then at some point, you're going to reach a tipping point where they can feel the effect efficiency. They feel the efficiency. They feel like their body is better and it starts to feel easier. It feels easier to turn because they're not fighting these forces away. So like because their back is not falling back and because they're not naturally just grinding themselves to a halt inside this turn, now I got their posture in the right spot. They can carry that turn. They're actually maybe building speed through the turn. They can feel that. They can feel their edge being much stronger. It's more solid. And then now they're starting to feel a lot better. So the, un the body is starting to go, wait a minute, this is actually better. So now it's willing to repeat it without fighting it. Now you're in business. And then ultimately you get to the downside of it where now on the downside of that arc where it's really feeling good. And then this is a chance where you can build. And that when it's on the downside of the curve where it's a feeling they're in the right posture, they have the right balance they have good edge control they can create consistency in the movement and then now they they're because of that consistency we can now build it's starting to feel better this is when you can start stacking things you can start stacking different types of movements you can start pairing it with other things you have different types of exits out of it you can start maybe bringing more movements into it this is kind of the moment so when you get in a private lesson what I like to do is find that target skill. So in this case, the, the, the example I'm using is a turn. It's very familiar to many people who have, they first have had to influence this particular skill. So you're very familiar with these problems. So it's an identify, very identifiable and very familiar problem that all of us have run into. When you're in that, and you find your way through the, 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 the back side of it and it starts to feel efficient and you can do, now you can really like teach. And what I've found when I've watched a lot of one-on-one -on -one situations, especially as it relates to skating, is when they're on the downside and they're, the player is actually making good progress, the instructor doesn't take advantage of that opportunity to stack and create new movements and and add new movements so one of the one of the things as it relates to to any type of skill is in hockey it's only really good when it's paired with something else it's done in a sequence hockey is hockey movement by nature is sequential so what i mean by that is you're not going to just turn the whole time you're not turning. You have to then exit the turn. There's a crossover exit. Maybe there's a weight shift crossover exit. There's maybe you're going into another turn. Go from one turn into the next. There's a, you could go in from a turn into like a pivot, whatever. There's a million ways in which you can uh, you can create these like exits. And in the exit, that's where the shouldering comes in, where you have two skills and initially. There's a space of time between the execution of two skills. So you have the turn, and then on the back side of that turn, there's a space of time where there's like nothing going on as the player's kind of reshifting their body, and then they go into the next skill. What we want to do is create efficiency between those two skills. So the shouldering, one skill just blends right into the next with no like dead time or space. The player has the body posture movement to be able to adjust their posture into the next movement so sometimes that posture has to change so i was when i'm on the inside edge uh sorry the outside edge on the inside foot inside this turn and now i want to now i want to cross over because i have the weight it goes from like you know it starts off with very little weight on it then as we get into the turn the turn 
we're starting to get more weight on it. Now it breaks like 60% the weight. It's a 60-40 or more split between the inside foot and the outside foot. Now I can release the weight off the back foot to initiate the crossover. So how quickly can I get the weight stacked onto the inside foot, outside edge to release the weight of the back foot so that now I can get in the crossover? That's, that's essentially shouldering or skill blending. Skill blending is really where you're really trying to get to. You're trying to make sure, because that's where the functionality of this skill is really gonna be apparent. And the more endings or uh, stacks you can put onto this thing, the better it's gonna be. So that was the other thing that I learned over the course of my time with private lessons is that a lot of times the best benefit you're getting from reshaping a skill and rebuilding a skill is the blending aspects after because that's going to improve the utility we hear all the time hey we want players to have to be variable to be able to do multiple different things and i say all the time yes but you need a technical base to be able to do that effectively this is what i'm talking about and the more capacity the player has in the blending the athleticism of being able to move from one movement quickly just naturally get into the next movement like when we were doing a lot of shooting development, um, the the shooting development, what happens is is that it's like two skills in one. So like a catch and shoot on the strong side is the best guys. That's one movement. To the degree that you're not effective at the catch and shoot is the time it takes from the catch to the shot. There's like a space of time. A lot of players in the space of time will handle the puck. And they, they overhandle it. They stick handle it. And that's obviously problematic. But it's the, the real problem is the skill blend. So if they're familiar with skill blending, they're going to be able to then catch it and shoot it all smoothly, all in one motion, and have their body move to accommodate that movement. And that's what's key. And that's a huge benefit to, to what you can do in one-on-one -on -one sessions. So that's the, that aspect, I think, is really important. Now, also with the skill blending, and when you're creating these shouldering situations, you're starting to look for different things to add to it. What also then comes is opportunity to talk about utility. Where else can we use this skill? Where else on the ice can we use this skill? Hey, we've been doing it here. Let's do it in this area of the ice. Let's do it in these game situations. What other endings could you then use? It could go into a shot. We could go into a fake shot pass. How's your body supposed to move in that? And you're creating these familiarities. And what you find is, is that now the player, and this is where I talk about the confidence level of the player in you and of relationship. So, Let's go back to the arc. You start off with the development. Player does not like the movement, even though it's going to be better the, the, and more efficient. They're attached to the familiarity of the way things are, and that's what they're good at. So now you go through the arc. You get you know get them to feel, uh, get them to feel first have an acute sense of feel as to what whether the rep was good or bad and how it felt for them, and then you gradually move them along. Ultimately, you get them to the top, the apex of the of the arc, and now you're going to head on the downside. Because the player has now felt a greater sense of efficiency, they see the benefits of moving this way, they see all the, they can feel faster, they can feel that it's easier to move this way, there's an efficiency that, that tr efficiency, for, when I say efficiency, that means easier, it's easier for the player to move it, they can carry speed uh, they can add things on without it being feeling clunky etc so you've made this progress with this player all the way up the mountain of the arc and now you're on the going to head on the downside of the arc they now have trust that you can rebuild the skill so when you start stacking on the bottom side you might have situations where you take a step back but it's okay because you've you've created a real uh, trust with the player. They're willing to now go through that uncomfortable stage of the development because they just did it once and it felt better. 
So now you have a second chance in this same skill set to build more of a, a deeper relationship with a player and build more trust with them. Trust meaning you are able to take them in a spot where they couldn't do it and then ultimately they could do it and when they could do it, it felt better. When they felt better, more efficient, more effective, now they're like, I like this, let's do more. So now when you introduce another skill that has uh, a, a real challenge to them, they're more than willing to go through it because they were effective the first time. And that's why I say the order that you do things is so important. Because if you don't do the right skill in its progression early, what's going to happen is, is that the player is going to lose confidence because you, they don't have the, 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 the foundation to be able to execute that skill. So that's why you have to do things in, in order till you get to a certain point. Once you get to a certain point, then they have the base. Now you can do whatever you want. That's why fundamental movement is so key because when a player has excellent fundamental movement, they now have the capacity to be able to stack things on top of each other. When they don't have that fundamental movement, this is where things get dropped. They have to take time in between. The shouldering of the movement gets more extended. It just becomes a problem. And they, there's frustration that comes into that. And sometimes that frustration is good, but you have to have an emotional bank account already built up to absorb that frustration. And that's, to me, was a real key. So rule number one for me, I got to learn how to manage this athlete's energy all the way through. Learn to do, to learn how to, how to uh, structure the ice so they get a, a, a lot of reps. The reps are appropriate for where we are in the development part. And then when I start extending the sequence it's after i've created efficiency so you see what i mean like i can now so i talked initially about shortening the duration of the movement to manage the rest and keep them focused on a certain part of the skill once we're on the back side of that we're in a better position because now the player feels good about where they're at they're much more efficient so now I can leverage the efficiency of the movement because now it's easier for them to do it less physically taxing. I can start adding other things. And so the duration of the drill and, the, and what we're doing can expand because I can leverage the efficiency of the movement to be able to get into this and not have it be a physical tax on the player that's unreasonable. These are the things that really stand out for me. And it doesn't matter what you do. And I'm using skating as a as the example but it literally could be anything right it, it's anything that you're trying to influence but you're always going to go through this similar type of process and that's been a process that i've i've utilized in, in as a million times to get me into an area where then now i have players on the back side of skill and i can start stacking things the other part about stacking is i can do and this is, was another area that I really like is I like to do like one build or like a rebuild. Get it on the backside, create some variability. Move it around to different situations, have some good discussion about where these skills might be utilized, how they might be utilized differently, etc. Then do then stop that development and then do another build. And then as we get through that build, then put them both together. So then that becomes a major part of like they can feel their body moving all efficiently from one movement to the next. And I've had uh, a target build plus quite a few uh, things that I'm stacking on top of that. So in the end, I might have used six or eight skills. Then I do another one. I get another six or eight skills. So now I have two targets with another 10 or 12 different movements. So I have two skills that were targets of mine that I really focused on. Created variability on the backside. We got all that organized. Then I now have a pool of all these different variations that I can now pull the two skill sets together that are not just two skills now. 
there are 12, 14 different skills that can be used in all types of different combinations, which is a lead into variability. So now I can then move it, challenge the spacing, which is the next thing. So as we move forward with the development, I want to challenge spacing, spacing and timing to execute the, sk the skills. And in a private lesson, it's just you and the player. So in that case, you have to challenge yourself in different ways. And that's why using the ice geography can be key. The space between the dot and the boards, the space between the hash marks and the net, the space between the goal line and the back boards. Like there's so many ways you can leverage this. The space between the blue lines, the red line to the blue line, the use of the corner. There's so many different things that you can do to limit space and manage the space so that you're now in a spot where you can you you know you you're challenging that space now when you get to the now when the player goes and they get into much more of a live event they're going against somebody well now they can start messing around with the timing and the spacing and the speed to be able to execute and they're starting to collect information so now the next time you see them you're talking about its utility what did you find well it takes me too long to get out of it and I, I feel like I have the player beat and then they catch me on the back side. I'm not exiting properly. Perfect. Now we know where to go. Like you're collecting information from the player of how they feel in the competitive environment so you can reshape whatever is the challenging piece so that they have more of a fair opportunity when they go next to make those adjustments inside the skill so that they can really create the competitive advantage that the skill is designed to produce. So those are a couple of key technical aspects of actual one-on-one -on -one util utility that I think are really important to keep in mind that gives you a bit of a head start with the player. And then, like I said, there's many more layers I could go to. I mean, in this particular, this particular domain, I probably could have five or six of these half hour 45 minute uh sessions to really go through the ins and outs of it uh, but this is a good start on some of the technical aspects of how to use how failure is attached to the technical development that you're really trying to get to and the use of failure which we talked about in the first one that's all fine and good but now you have to have a process that allows you to take them through and have them in a spot where you can really maximize the effect of that. And that's really what I, what I was uh, striving to convey here in, uh, in, this, uh, in this particular episode.